welcome to Doing the Work, the frontline stories of social change, where we bring you stories of real people working to address real issues. I am your host, Shimon Cohen. In this episode, I talk with Jaleel Muntakim, who is a revolutionary and a community organizer with Citizen Action of New York. Jaleel is a former member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army and former political prisoner, having served almost 50 years in prison since being arrested when he was 19 years old. He was employed as a social worker at the time. We are celebrating his one-year release from prison. We talk about prison, his involvement in the BPP and BLA, his organizing from within prison, as well as his current organizing. He talks about the repression he experienced for his efforts, including being placed in solitary confinement multiple times, the last time for teaching a history class to prisoners that included teaching about the Black Panther Party. Jaleel emphasizes the dehumanizing nature of prison and makes clear that they never broke him. He has never stopped organizing and fighting for Black liberation. During his decades in prison, Jaleel earned numerous educational degrees, authored two books, led multiple education programs, and mentored many younger incarcerated men. Jaleel talks about the United States being guilty of committing genocide of black people and indigenous people and how he is organizing an international tribunal to formally charge the U.S. with these crimes. He provides the definition of genocide, which leads us into a conversation about social work's complicity with genocide due to being part of the removal of black children and indigenous children from their families. I am so honored to have been able to interview him and help share his story in powerful words that always emphasize the need to resist. I hope this conversation inspires you to action. Jaleel, thanks so much for coming on, doing the work. You're most welcome, my brother. It's uh, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to even be invited as a guest, so I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. Oh, man. You know, it is my absolute honor for a few reasons. Number one is we're celebrating a year since you've been out of prison, which is a cause to celebrate. So let's just get into that a little bit. Like, how are you feeling these days? Well, it'll be a, it'll be a year on October 6th. It will be exactly one year. And uh, as I have told many and I adhere to this position uh, for the world to know, I am blessed. You know, I feel blessed. And I have, I have the opportunity to uh, uh, get myself really settled in uh, the community that I'm in and uh, back out here doing the work. You know, I'm, um, I've been uh, um, <clears throat> uh, hired by an organization called Citizen Action of New York. And they are a statewide organization that deals with the issues of, of them with, with the community uh, at large. And, and in their, in their, um, uh, preamble or their their positions, they are anti-capitalist, and so that in and of itself, an anti-racist, anti-white supremacist, right? As an organization, and for an organization to state that from the jump, you know, this is what they are—a statewide organization that gets work done, uh, and then to hire uh, me. Well, hey, <laughs> <laughs> what can you say? You know, yeah. So I'm in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I definitely got to give props to them for hiring you because. You know, there was obviously a lot of a lot in the media. I'm sure there was a lot of attacks going on about that. And so that that says a lot that they did that. And, you know, if I if I think of the name of this podcast doing the work, you know, I can't think of someone who more embodies that than you, man, you know, and, you know, just before we get into all of it, too, is, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time, right? Like, and and I and so for me, this is the other part of why it's such an honor to have you on here, because I think we met when I was like, I don't remember the exact age, but it was like 21, 22. I had no, I didn't know what social work was. You know, I was, um, we connected through a community organizing project, the Victory Gardens that right. you helped, or, that you organized from behind bars, right? Myself and, myself and my, co- my co-defendant. Uh, yeah. Herman Bell actually was the one who initiated the uh, uh, Victory Gardens. And uh, pulled me into as a, a sponsoring co a co sponsor of Victory Gardens, and uh, the the Victory Gardens lasted for several years, and they uh, uh, produced over 
think, think 10 tons of produce that were distributed in Brooklyn, uh, uh, the Bronx, uh, uh, um, Harlem, Newark, uh, Newark, Boston, um, and uh, free food, free produce, you know, and we had uh, young people come up from the inner cities to Maine, where the uh, the farm was, and do farming uh, and harvesting uh, to really get to touch uh, the land and what it, what it means to be a farmer, you know, have them understand, the inner city kids understand where their food comes from, you know, and the labor and how the labor intensity it is uh, to feed this planet. Uh, it was a, a very good uh, enlightening uh, project for not only for me, you know, in terms of being a sponsor of it and, and, and as a political prisoner being a sponsor of it, but ensuring that uh, that kind of uh, rural and urban uh, relationship uh, was, was brought together. Uh, I have also give a lot of credit to uh, uh, Rodney Jackson and his mom's, uh, uh, Miss Jackson uh, in Newark, you know, who are very much uh, 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 advocates. Uh, for Victory Gardens and supported it. Yeah, it was it was it was, it was a very good uh, project that was put together by my co-defendant Herman and myself. Yeah, and shout out to Carol Dove and Michael Vernon, who were the farmers in Maine. And the other aspect of that project, which was for me essential to who I am, was the political education aspect of it. You know, that's how I furthered my own understanding. Um, Thanks to all the folks just named and and you about that there are U.S. you know that there are political prisoners in the United States. That's how I learned about the Black Panther Party because of course I didn't get any of that in school. And you know you and I have continued this communication over the years, and a lot of that led you know to my interest in doing community based work, and which led me to doing work with youth and led me to social work. You know, and I even remember. When I was opening up this youth center, you know, writing to you about like the different kinds of programming and, you know, you writing back because we had to write letters, right? Those were handwritten (laughs) (laughs) letters. (laughs) Yeah. And plus the, you know, going to see you in prison. And I mean, that was a whole experience in and of itself. Not like, I mean, obviously positive to see you, but a horrific experience as yeah. well. Yeah, they try to discourage people from coming to prisons, you know, to visit their loved ones, uh, their family members. Uh, you know, it's, prison is dehumanizing. And it's dehumanizing for the family members to come into the prison system and dehumanizing for the prison themselves. Uh, they, they try to degrade and diminish one's uh, own humanity you know, as part of the process of breaking and trying to break an individual, trying to break them uh, uh, in their own sense of self, you know. Uh, that's what prison is in the United States. The prison is, in fact, a slavery system. It's a slaveocracy, you know, based upon the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution. That states emphatically that slavery and voluntary servitude uh, shall not exist in the United States except for those who have been duly convicted of a crime. So that indicates, you know, based upon the Constitution, that prisons are, in fact, slave plantations. Yeah, and and all the ones that I visited you at and that, and you were at others that I know I didn't see, they, you know, these places are deliberately put in the most rural, far away from, you know, the city, far away from family and friends, you know, and I think that needs to be discussed, especially for people who like, have never been to one, you know, have never gone to visit a friend or a family member in a prison. It is, it's an indescribable experience, but you're, you were the one there. You know, you were the one in these places so far removed from everybody. Yeah, well, nearly 50 years, nearly 50 years I was in prison from the age of 19 to the age of 69. And um, I experienced um, the worst of the worst, uh, both in California as well as in uh, in the state of New York. Uh, Every maximum security prison that I had in the state of New York, uh, I had been in it at one point in time and several several of them several times uh, during the course of uh, nearly 50 years of imprisonment. And of course, uh, naturally, you know, as a result of my own uh, activism inside prison, you know, I had to confront some of the most racist and uh, bigots, uh, um, brutal uh, prison guards uh, that they that they have, you know, uh, and being able to survive some of those uh, those attacks. You know, I, yes, I was attacked in prison at uh, one time or another by prison guards, and I had to defend myself as a result of those attacks and. Uh, I haven't survived that. I've been placed in solitary confinement uh, for months at a time. 
uh, uh, several times uh, as a result of me organizing inside prison or uh, teaching inside prison. Uh, the last time I was in the, in the solitary confinement in the box was for teaching a class that I was approved to teach in Attica. And because they didn't like what I was teaching and what I was uh, prepared, prepared my students to receive uh, after about, mm, about six weeks of teaching, I had um, started in 1861 uh, and moved up to 1966. And when I got to 1966, they want to put a halt to it because in 1966, you had to talk about the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing that's going on in this country. And uh, so when I got to talk about the Black Panther Party, they said, wait a minute, we don't want you teaching that. And they put me in solitary confinement for four months uh, and saying that I was trying to uh, teach the gangs uh, uh, to be militants and, and revolutionaries rather than to be criminals and, uh, and, and common criminals and, and vying and fighting against each other rather than organizing themselves into a coherent uh, capacity to empower uh, themselves and the community from which they are uh, evolved from. And so they don't like for, for people to be empowered and uh, for anyone to teach that. And so by my teaching that to empower them, uh, they felt that was a threat because uh, they no longer would have that kind of control. And so they put me in solitary confinement uh, for four months. Ultimately, the court reversed uh, that um, those charges and it was expunged from my record. In fact, the court uh, in their decision stated that this guy is actually teaching a course and teaching the class and teaching history, you know, and uh, that's just what they said in the, in the decision. Wow. And, yeah, and so they dismissed the charges and had it expunged from my record. So for people listening, you know, what is, what is that like? Four months in solitary confinement. What does that feel? You know, what does that feel like? Taste like? Smell like? Just what is that like? <laughs> you, don't, you don't want the smell. <laughs> Let me tell you, you don't want the smell uh, or, or or the food. You know, you don't even taste the food. Uh, it's it's hard. Uh, There's no, no other way to put it. You know, here you are locked in a cell 23 hours a day. Uh, and you're on a tier with other men who have been locked in a cell 23 hours, some of them for months, some of them for years. Uh, in solitary confinement, and many, uh, I say many, but there are few who have basically uh, lost their, their mental capacity to hold on to uh, reality. And as a result, you know, we hear them screaming at night. We hear them uh, 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 banging on the bars at night. Uh, you hear them uh, arguing and or, or even throwing feces and, and, and uh, urine uh, at people pass by uh, just to get, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the, what the, the the, the dynamics in their, in their mind for doing such a such a uh, 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 dehumanizing thing, but <clears throat> but I, I think the results of it is the fact that you know uh, a human being should not be locked in a cell uh, for 23 hours a day. Period. Right. Uh, that in itself is crushing, mm -hmm. and so it takes a uh, an individual who has some kind of uh, presence of mind in regards to what are the circumstances for which they have to survive uh, to maintain their sanity. Uh, for me, that was the case. I was able to uh, read. I was able to exercise in the cell, and I was able to write. Uh, in fact, uh, during the course of that last months of, uh, of being in uh, being in, in the solitary confinement, I de devised the means uh, and prepared, prepared a proposal to have the international jurists uh, come back to the United States. I had done it before, uh, several about two decades prior, um, and I was able to again make a proposal for international jurors to come to the United States to discuss the issues of human rights uh, and uh, organizations of political prisoners and the question of genocide. And gratefully, uh, my comrades who received my proposal uh, agreed, this was in 2018, agreed that they are uh, willing to organize this. And so I am eager to announce that on uh, October 22nd to the 25th, at um, Malcolm X the Betty Shabazz Center, uh, we will be hosting the International Tribunal. And the International Tribunal is charging genocide. We are charging genocide against the United States. We are also honoring the 70th year, the 70th year of when the first time we charged genocide was brought to the United Nations by the great uh, Paul Robeson and William Patterson. That was in uh, December 15th, uh, 1951, uh, two months after my birth, in fact. And so here we are, the seventh year and the anniversary, and uh, we are recharging genocide again. And so we are putting forth um, a whole gamut of issues that we're bringing to the international community uh, that accumulatively uh, raises the questions, uh, raises the issue 
uh, that we talk about black people, brown people, indigenous people in the United States has suffered uh, conditions of genocides. So, let, so let's get a little more into that tribunal. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I, I can. The United States Tribunal has about six charges. People can go to the spiritmandela.org and uh, get all the information in regards to the, the, the charges. Uh, and again, the, the, the cumulative, the cumulative charges amounts to genocide. A lot of people don't know uh, the, the difference or the meaning of genocide. And if you give me an opportunity, I'll try to uh, um, very basically explain what what it is that we are charging the United States. Right? According to the International Convention of Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, uh, this House Court states in Article Two. A quote, in the present convention, genocide means any and the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part by a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, such as A, killing members of the group. They know they could be killing us, right? They be killing us, okay? Uh, two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. They do that. We have recorded history. Right. C. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And we say that international, uh, we can say that institutional racism or white supremacy is the concept, is the idea of anti-black. All right. Uh, and therefore, by virtue of that concept, we have that idea that is institutionalized in this country. Then for the most part, we can say at least in whole or in part. Right, that our bodies deliberately inflicting the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical uh, destruction in whole or in part. Uh, D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. We know that they have been engaged in that, particularly sterilizing people of color. Uh, there has been issues with the sterilizing uh, Puerto Rican women uh, for a period of time. It was a big, a decade long struggle against that. In California today, uh, there is a lawsuit against them uh, uh, sterilizing women in prison right, in California. Uh, and uh, so the issue of sterilization of, of women, particularly black women, uh, Native Americans, and indigenous, and as well as uh, brown women, uh, Latinx uh, women, is uh, part of their eugenics, right? The, the principles of eugenics that is applicable uh, to the idea of upholding uh, white supremacy. Uh, five, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. We know they do that, right? They've been doing that, to, especially the indigenous uh, community, where they have taken the, the Native American children and sent them out for adoption or sent them out to various other groups. Uh, or what they're doing in the black community today, what sociologists uh, should be really uh, fighting against is the, the grief by which uh, black children, uh, people of color, are being put in foster care, right? Uh, the means of why they are put in those those kind of conditions is subject to a whole gamut of um, uh, institutional racism uh, that black people and brown people, particularly women, are, are confronting in this country. Right. Further, Article Three further states that the following shall be punishable. Punishable. Right. A. Genocides. B. Conspiracy to commit genocides. D. Direct and public incitement to commit genocides. Uh, D. Attempt to commit genocides. And E, complicity in genocide. And I think that when we look at the, the, the convention itself in the totality and look at the, the, the uh, uh, array of, or, uh, yeah, array of uh, conditions from which black people are eking out uh, existence in the United States, all right, uh, everything from uh, the which question that I said about uh, uh, sterilization, but even if we look at the issues of mass incarceration, right, where they are putting young black, brown people in prison at a young age, Right. And hold them in prison 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Right. At the time when they're in their ripe year of reproducing. Right. Pre preventing that from happening. Right. Preventing for decades uh, these young people from uh, reproducing. Right. And therefore uh, decimating or uh, diminishing the capacity for the population to grow. Right. As an example, uh, black people in America. Right, what I call them African people, and that's a little story. But black people in America, in terms of their, their demographics, their population, has not exceeded 13% of the entire population. And that's been in the, in the last 50 years, right, from 11 to 13% in the last 50 years. So that indicates for me, right, 
uh, looking at the historical and chronological uh, question of uh, our, our history in the United States, that we have been suffering to degrees of genocide in whole or in part. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting an important point that mass incarceration serving as a form of like population control. Absolutely. That's a fact, right? And uh, we're, we're happy that uh, um, Michelle Alexander and her book, uh, The New Jim Crow, was able to bring that into the national debate. But personally, I've been arguing for that for uh, 20 years before the book even came out. You know, the issues of mass incarceration and the, the, the question of our being uh, used uh, as part of the, the capitalist system for uh, profit, uh, wage labor and profit and exploiting uh, people of color by using the court system and the, the uh, last rung of the judicial system being prison, being the last rung of that process uh, to keep people under control and to reap profits of their misery. So what happens when or let's what happens if the tribunal of these international jurors does find the US complicit in genocide like then what happens? Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. So we have a whole answer for you, all right? The whole answer is this here. Uh the the international tribunal it, it has several uh uh goals and objectives to, to achieve. One of those objectives is to ensure that the international community understands what our fight is inside the United States, within the, uh, the 3,000 by 2,000 mile uh, um, territory uh, borders that we have identified or have been identified as the United States. I don't know how much United is, but it is a question. I don't even know how many states, I mean, how many, we consider them states, but that goes to another question of what uh, the United States is. Because if you go to 28 USC, 3006, I think it indicates that the United States is, in fact, a corporation, called a federal corporation. So essentially, the American population is citizens of a corporation. But that goes to a whole other uh, legal argument and that dynamics involved with that. Okay. But you can go to USC, uh, 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 28 USC um, 3002 or 3006, that informs that the United States, in fact, is a corporation. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, the international jurors, the international, if they were to def- uh, uh, condemned uh, the United States for the acts of genocide against black, brown, and indigenous people, then what we intend to do is file a civil action in the federal courts. Uh, file a civil action in the federal courts and hopefully have amicus carrier briefs, not only from activists across the country, but uh, amicus carrier briefs, which means friends of the court briefs, uh, filing in support of our own civil petition uh, from the international community as well. Uh, uh, from that point, uh, we began to continue to promote and propagate and, and, and build upon the civil lawsuit and build support towards that. And we'll be calling for uh, building a what we call a people's senate in 2022. So uh, people should be prepared. Uh, we think there's a need for a, a, a third voice right, uh, uh, for uh, people in, in the United States to really uh, challenge uh, the corporate uh, parties, uh, when I say corporate parties, I'm talking about the Democrat and Republican Party, which people have been tied to. And we think there's a need for a third voice, uh, a new narrative uh, in regards to people power and what does that mean. And so we're trying to build, we will move towards building a, a people's Senate, uh, essentially it's gonna be uh, a composite of a, a united front uh, uh, as a third voice in, in the United States. Uh, Deny, uh, the Black Panther Party attempted to do so at one point in time. Uh, we are older members of the Black Panther Party, older members of the Young Lords, older members of AIM, uh, American Indian Movement, uh, all of whom have uh, come to a conclusion that it's time for us to rise and uh, reassert our own uh, future, being future focused, reassert our determination and our own destiny. And in this instance, we're using uh, the backdrop of the international community as our foundation to move forward. Uh, we need to, Al Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, uh, warned us, actually he instructed us uh, that we need to take our struggle outside of the civil confines of the of the United States. Uh, he felt that, and he made the instructions that if you continue to keep your movement within the confines of civil rights, then there'll be a way for the, the United States to use this issue uh, domestically, to control it domestically. But when you bring it to the international community, you have raised it outside of the purview of civil rights, and it has now become a human right. And so we're saying that the issues of the confronting black, brown, and indigenous people are questions that, uh, that are based upon our human rights being violated. And therefore, the United States 
uh, for our weaker side, uh, in this, uh, this dynamic, uh, we're saying that they are engaged in the practices of genocide. And, uh, so, uh, I'll give you another example of the, 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 the necessity of force moving in this direction. What happened on, on, on January 6th, uh, of this year, uh, when the white supremacists uh, stormed our uh, Congress, and, uh, uh, none of them were, uh, for the most part, uh, I think one woman was shot. But for the most part, they were not uh, mowed down if it were black, brown, or indigenous people storming uh, Congress. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind or anybody else's mind that they would have been mowed down. There would have been bodies laid all over the uh, the plaza of the of Congress. Right? And that did not happen. And so we have to ask yourself why that did not happen. And obviously, obviously, it didn't happen because the institutions uh, supported the individuals uh, who uh, uh, rampaged the Congress. Right, and I mean support of them ideologically, not so much support of the act that they committed, but support of them ideologically. They're all on the same page. They're same page of white supremacy, and so for us, particularly black, browns, and indigenous people, we have to come to the conclusion that this country is a white supremacist country. Right, anybody who thinks otherwise is delusional. Right, and I don't mind saying that. Right, they're delusional. That is the reality, and we need to face that reality. Seventy million people. 70 million people voted for an avowed white supremacist, Donald Trump, yep. right? And out of that 70 million, I imagine there is at least another 30 million who supported him or are voiceless. So that means there's about approximately 100 million people in this country who are advent white supremacists, right? That's one third of the population of the United States, okay? And they're not going anywhere, okay? Uh, in fact, they have, as of January 6th, declared that they are engaged in, uh, in, in a new war, right? Uh, a civil war, uh, that they will not be replaced, as it was said in, uh, I think, South Carolina or North Carolina. Charlottesville, couple, yeah. Charlottesville a couple of years ago, right? And they are serious about that. And I believe them. They said it, I believe them. And so that means that we need to set up the, the conditions uh, that we need to defend ourselves uh, uh, in order to survive uh, what is coming, right? And if we're not prepared, Right? They say those who, who fail to prepare, uh, fail to prepare, uh, uh, prepare to fail. Okay? And so we need to prepare. And therefore, the People's Senate is going to be by which we start preparing uh, for that third voice uh, to ensure that we, uh, people of color in the United States, uh, are empowered and that our voices will be heard uh, in, in defense of our own very existence. Uh, the end of the, this is the ending of uh, uh, the the promotion of uh, white supremacy and, and genocide in the United States. So we'll link the Spirit of Mandela website with the information about the tribunal on there. We'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it on the website. And I really want to encourage the listeners, you know, to learn about it, to get involved. To you know, you covered so much. Um, Different terminology, you know, people like take the time and look that up, educate yourselves and, you know, to connect to social work, which is connected to this podcast, just because that's like my profession is like social workers have been complicit in a lot of this and these, you know, removals of indigenous children, you know, the breakdown, the child welfare system, or as folks are calling it, the family regulatory system, um, family regulation system. And so, you know, social work has to uh, confront this, and the National Association of Black Social Workers have been challenging this uh, since 1968. So just wanted to put that out there. It is my hope that the National uh, Association of Social Workers, the National Association of Black Psychologists, or, sociolo- uh, or, or psychiatrists, and socio- what, psychologists and psychiatrists, right, will put together an amicus uh, carrier brief. Uh, that will be filed in support of their argument, their understanding of how white supremacy has damaged, traumatized uh, people of color in this country. And we can use that as part of our uh, support, right? Uh, our legal arguments uh, for the amicus carrier brief uh, to be filed along with the civil complaint that we're going to file after the tribunal. Absolutely. So, you know, I know you jumped like right into the tribunal and what you're doing now. and I, And I love that because. That, that's what I've always known about you. You're all about the work. You get right into it. I want to go over some history to talk about, you know, um, I think a lot of folks, I know a lot of folks, especially young folks, don't have the history. Mm-hmm. 
So I want to talk about the Black Panther Party, you know, which the original name, right? Black Panther Party for self-defense. That's very important. Very important. But before we do that, yeah, and I, 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 I want to do that. But before you do that, there's one word that you used a minute ago, and it struck me because I've been using it uh, quite regularly, uh, and it's a word called complicity. Mm-hmm. What is the, the means or what is the nature of complicity, right? And I think that um, as a result of, I'm, I'm just going to make uh, two points in regards to that, right? The United States has blood on their hands. Absolutely. Right. right? And they have been complicit in U.S. imperialism. Uh, they have been complicit and uh, U.S. Uh, colonialism. They have been complicit in U.S. neocolonialism. Uh, Martin Luther King once said that the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Right? Purveyor of violence in the world. I that's my words. This is Martin Luther King's word. The, the, the individuals that have made a national holiday over. <laughs> right. right. And he, he said that. Okay. And by saying that, he's also saying that we have been complicit, right, in allowing this government, this corporate government, to engage in that type of violence throughout the world, right? Another point in regards to white supremacy, right? White supremacy is, is an aberration. Anyone who believes white supremacy is an aberration. Anyone who believes that they are superior to any other person, any other human being on the planet, right? Because of the color of their skin, is neurotic, right? And I once talked to a, a psychologist about that, and I said, you know, the white supremacy the, as an aberration, the, the ideological aberration, is, 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 is a neurosis. She said, she said, like, I said, no, it's not a neurosis. It's a psychosis. I said, what do you mean? Because they engage in mass murder. They engage in such violence, right, psychotic violence around the world, right, to uphold the ideals of white supremacy. And so this idea of white supremacy, not so much any different than that of the ideals of Adolf Hitler, right, uh, uh, engage in the kind of psychosis of that they are, uh, feel immune uh, from the kind of mass murder uh, that they have committed uh, all over the planet. And so the international community, in my thinking, right, is waiting for the American public, public to be woke, right, to set responsibility of their complicity, right, in the work this corporate government is doing, right, in support of the idea of the psychosis uh, we call the phenomenon that they call white supremacy, right, that has been engaged in the last, what, uh, four or five hundred years, right, of engagement. Uh, uh, around the world and the kind of the death throats that they have uh, created around the world. Uh, the United States public are complicit in their own silence and they fail to fight back. Uh, and so we're saying that for the next generation, the generation to come, right, uh, we're going to end that kind of complicity, right? Uh, there was a time in our history in the United States where uh, the American populace rose up against that kind of violence. And that was during the, the, the anti-Vietnam War uh, campaign, right? Uh, where we actually stopped uh, the United States um, along with the, the Vietnamese people who no longer want them in their country, uh, prevent them to, uh, to, to end that war, right? There has not been that kind of um, uh, active internationalism, solidarity amongst the public uh, 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 in this country since then. Uh, and we need to rise up again, you know, uh, uh, to the extent where we understand our own, uh, the, the United States complicity uh, in this kind of violence and uh, the need for us to, to uh, uh, charge this government uh, with that kind of violence. Uh, that we need to end it. We need to end it. We need to find our own humanity, the depth of our humanity, right, uh, to the humanity of people around the world. Right? We have lost that. And we've been lost by the indoctrination of, of, of the American people. The indoctrination that began from K-12, right? With the idea of a manifest destiny, with the idea of the Monroe Doctrine, right? Things that we are taught to believe uh, that makes uh, America exceptional to any other nation or any other people on this planet, right? And that's a bold-faced lie. And we have been living that lie for too long. Okay, Black Panther Party. <laughs> no, I... I'm glad you said all that, you know, and it, and I think it really challenges everyone to like really look like, well, what, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing to, to change this? You know, I, I'm saying for everyone 
we all need to be asking ourselves that, you know, and then and then getting involved, you know, getting involved with 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 the work that's happening and making mm-hmm. it happen because there's going to be place people who there isn't work happening maybe around them and they need to get connected to folks who are and and learn about this and then of course there's the aspect of continuing to pass on this knowledge, right? So that's the part where to me it connects to the history is there, you know, there's so much there. I've I've noticed this like interest, this re, this you know, I don't know if I want to call it a new interest, but I've seen more and more folks who are interested in the Black Panther Party, and specifically like the community based programs, right? And there was like there's been some articles that have come out. Um, one came out, you know, saying like you know those free breakfasts in schools, you know, you can thank the Black Panther Party for that, you know, and then. There was a really good article about um, the Panthers and the Young Lords instituting like a substance abuse program in in New York, but the Panthers can't be looked at without the context of everything they were about. Agreed. So I was hoping you could kind of talk about that and talk about like what led you to joining the Panthers when you were a teenager, because you joined when you were a teenager. That's true. That's true. Well, um, so take us back. <laughs> take us back. Back to the future. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going back to the future. Let me begin with by just stating that I was raised in a household where my family members were conscious of who we are as a people. I was raised with the understanding that I am an African. Right. My mom, as a young woman, was a student of African dance. Right. And as a result, her African dance teacher used to teach her about African culture. And therefore, as, as I was growing up as a young child, my mom used to tell us, as she was teaching us African dance, as she learned it, right, that we are African. We are descendants of Africans, and we come from Africa, right? And so we never have, in our household, the idea that we are a Negro, right, some made-up word, or we are a colored person, another made-up identification, or that we are now this, uh, this convoluted uh, identity of being an African and an American, right, an African-American. Uh, this uh, this hyphenated uh, identity, uh, which is, in my thinking, is schizophrenic because uh, America has never been in support of Africa, yet we are supportive of America and not in support of Africa. So and essentially, those who identify themselves as African-American are against one part of the part that they say that they support or identify themselves with. Right? I don't understand how they do that. But at any rate, uh, this is why I do not identify myself as an African-American, because I think there's a whole collective idea of who I am as identity, and the identity that I identify with is new African. I identify myself as a new African. And I won't go into the, to, to the whole thread of that, but so we get back to the point. I was raised with the idea that I'm African. That's number one, okay? Um, my mom's a part of NAACP, so she used to drag us along on those marches you know, when I was a youngster uh, in those uh, civil rights marches. And by the time I was a teenager, I, I became a member of the Black Student Union in my high school, right, fighting for ethnic studies, what they call ethnic studies today, what the back then was called black studies, because they didn't have black studies in schools. And so we had to fight to get black studies in schools. Uh, one of my mentors in high school, my math mentor, because I was always good in school anyway, but one of my mentors in, in, in high school was John Carlos. And many of you may remember the iconic picture of John Carlos and uh, Tommy Smith raising their fist in the 1968 uh, uh, Olympics in Mexico City. Well, that's the era that I was raised in, uh, that kind of dynamic I was raised in, doing in, in high school. Uh, so in high school, I used to go on, on, on speaking engagements uh, with the Black Student Union, our president of uh, San Jose State and also San Jose City College. And myself, the three of us would go on different, uh, we call speak outs, and do all the different places and raise the issues and questions of uh, black studies and black culture. Um, by the time I was 16, uh, I was uh, hanging out with my friends in San Francisco uh, who had since become uh, um, a Black Panther Party members. And I decided uh, one day we was out in front of the Black Panther office on Fillmore Street. Uh, we was uh, putting p- bundling papers to be distributed across the country. And I decided to go in and sign in and become a member of the Black Panther Party. Uh, that was at the age of 16. I was active in that sense of, you know, helping with the paperwork and stuff like that, but not really an active member uh, in all of the programs that they had going on, like the free breakfast program, free health clinics. Uh, uh, food packages for families, the transportation uh, of uh, family members to prisons to v- visit loved ones, 
or even the what we call today cop watch, right? The cop watch program uh, that originated with the Black Panther Party. Uh, until I returned to the Black Panther Party at the age of 18, and that's where he got involved in those kind of programs, progressive program, health clinic programs, and also doing some security work when we had dignitaries come to the come to the San Francisco area uh, under the sponsorship of the Black Panther Party. Uh, sometimes I was in uh, uh, security areas or uh, on the perimeter for security uh, for those for those events, uh, and eventually it led to me being recruited into what's called the Black Underground. Uh, at the age of 18, going on 19, I was recruited to the Black Underground. Uh, one thing that people do not understand about the Black Panther Party uh, that they had a rule. They had rules. One of the rules, rule number six, says no Black Panther Party member can join an underground organization except for the Black Liberation Army. And so, when we understand that that the Black Liberation Army was part of the uh, division of, of uh, Bobby Seals and Huey Newton when they. Uh, Originally, uh, put the forth uh, the idea of there will be a revolution headed by the Black Liberation Army, uh, headed by, by the Black Panther Party. Uh, they also understood that there would be a need for armed struggle. And so, within the rules of the Black Panther Party, way back in the days, was that no uh, Black Panther Party can join a underground organization except for the Black Liberation Army. So, that was already written into the rules. And uh, as part of the evolving of the uh, Black Panther Party, they did have a, a Black Underground. And eventually I was recruited into the Black Underground, and it resulted in my being uh, captured and sent to prison for nearly 50 years. The other thing I think is just so important is like, you know, from what, I, from what I've learned from you and, and others, you know, over, over the years is that you all really like felt at that time like that you were on like the verge of revolution in this country. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, it's not just us. And that's just the Black Panther Party. Right. Remember, there was also the Brown Berets, also the Young Lords. There was also AIM, uh, American Indian Movement. There's also uh, the SDS, uh, Student for Democratic Society, and uh, the Mother Underground, and a host of other uh, 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 revolutionary organizations that was uh, engaged uh, during the turbulent 60s. Uh, there was riots going on across the country. You know, people were uh, angry. People were upset, and they showed that by virtue of their uh, insurrections. Okay, insurrection doesn't make a movement. Insurrection does not make a revolution. That's the lessons learned. Uh, but insurrection does check the temperature of what's going on in society at large. And uh, and so we, as as as, as what happened recently, or not said recently, within the last ten years, uh, with the many deaths of black people in this country and the advent of uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, it, it indicates what has happened in the interim. When there was this uh, destruction of the Black Panther Party, destruction of the various other revolutionary movements going on at that time, by virtue of COINTELPRO, all right, uh, the, the onslaught of uh, the government to squash uh, revolutionary activities in this country, uh, there was a law, and the law created the condition for, uh, again, the kind of uh, gross uh, dehumanization and uh, 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 diminishing uh, value of black people that it had to come a point in time where black people had to come again and says, Hey, our lives do in fact value, has value, has, that it matters, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's where we are today, resurrecting uh, uh, the value of black lives, uh, resurrecting the value of black lives in a very concrete and substantial way, right? In a way that we are seeking uh, 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 institutional change, right? substantial institutional change, uh, how we are governed, right? And how the government governs. And so that is the process that we engaged in today. The uh, Black Panther Party was instrumental in setting a foundation, uh, as, as did the Young Lords, and as did the Brown Berets, as did AIM, as did the Weather Underground, uh, uh, in recognizing a history of uh, resistance uh, in, 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 this, in this particular country. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, are interested in that history, a history of armed struggle, but that's nothing new in this country. You know, when we look at the the Reverend Nat Taylor, right, and his insurrections, and we look at the uh, Denmark Vessing, right, uh, uh, back in in the days, and we look at um, the Afro brother, uh, uh, African Blood Brotherhood, uh, uh, that a lot of people don't even know existed, or armed uh, uh, black uh, revolutionaries, and we look at the Deacons for Defense, right, uh, armed uh, Deacons and, and and preachers who uh, uh, kept security for the, the civil rights movement. Uh, and we look at an organization called RAM, Revolutionary Action Movement, and various others. 
that there always been this thread. When we look at Robert Williams, for example, who wrote the book Negroes with Guns, right? There's always been this thread of uh, within our history in this country of this kind of armed resistance. And so Black Liberation Army is just one uh, uh, aspect of that historical thread. Uh, and we don't know what's going to come next, if there have to be a next. But, but we should note that uh, this is not an aberration in our history uh, of, of resistance in the United States. Yeah, and I think something that's really interesting is that, you know, Black Panther Party shows up at the Capitol in California with guns and the NRA is passing gun control and Ronald Reagan are passing gun control laws. But we see white people doing mass shootings all over the place. And where are the gun control laws? Absolutely correct. No, no, it's uh, and that, that's that's ironic because you know, uh, California at that time was a, a open carry state, as we have now in many states of the country today. But when black people organized and are carrying guns, they want to change the law, right? They want to make it oh no, we can't have open carry anymore, all right? Because black people are now using the law uh, to their own be- benefit, right? Uh, to their own best interest. And so when we start using the law in our own best interest, they want to change the law. You know, one of the things I heard you say on the first time you were on the Hella Black podcast, so shout out to Hella Black, is that the Black Panther Party and the BLA, there was a direct correlation with the with the reduction in the number of deaths of black people killed by police. So I was hoping Absolutely. you could speak to that. Well, I mean, it's, uh, this is history. It's, it's statistically proven that when black people engage and are uh, uh, in, and engage in self-defense, uh, that the attacks on black people are, are lessened, right? Uh, when they know there's going to be retaliatory uh, responses to wholesale murdering of black people, uh, the wholesale murdering of black people is uh, 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 decreases, right? And then once the um, uh, that threat uh, to white supremacy is removed, then there's uh, an upsurge of uh, increased uh, killing of black people. And so uh, it, statistically, that, that's well established. It is not a question of my uh, hypothesis. Uh, this is a fact, okay? Uh, and so uh, it is important for us to understand that, uh, that we defend ourselves, that we're actually preserving our own uh, existence. Right, and that point, though, of that, then the law gets changed, right? And, and then we see the results of that, or the response is a program like COINTELPRO, which I think a lot of people today don't even know what that is, you know? And maybe if they've seen Judas and the Black Messiah, they will get a glimpse of COINTELPRO, so I hope people will check that out. But I know for me, when I was like, like I was saying, like 21, 22 years old, learning about political prisoners in the U.S., learning about the Panthers, about AIM, you know, American Indian Movement. And I learned about COINTELPRO. Like, it was like, it sh- you know, it sh- it's like a shattering type of thing when you've grown up being taught a certain way about this country. And then you learn about that, that the, you know, that the government did this. And people need to know about it. People can go YouTube and, and, and YouTube uh, COINTELPRO and learn right out the mouth of J. Edgar Hoover what's the golden objective of COINTELPRO. The golden objective of COINTELPRO was to stop the rise of a black messiah, right? Uh, anyone who was able to come to uh, the forefront and organize black people in their own best interest and for their own liberation, right? So that's the primary goal the objective of uh of uh, Quarantel Pro is the preservation of white supremacy. But not not only that, but the, the, it's just most recently, right, we have what they call the black identity extremists likely motivate target law enforcement officers, right? So now if you're black and advocating for black, then you consider a black extremist, okay? Now they don't say anything about white people advocating for white people, right, as being white extremists, Right. right. Uh, at least not recently. OK. Uh, but for black folks to do so, they come up with a, a law, uh, a, 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 a whole philosophy by which they can say they can con- condemned, condemned uh, uh, black minded people who think about black black lives, you know, uh, and call them extremists. Uh, so uh, they, they don't even want black people to even think of themselves as uh, uh, being valued enough for them um, to organize themselves for their own best interests, 
Right. And in order to do so, uh, without having been able to be exploited, right, uh, then you are in, in opposition to the to the United States. Yeah, you know, the white extremists got one white extremist got put in as president and had other white extremists <laughs> as part of his, you know, advisory in, in cabinet. Yeah, of course, of course. So, right. And that's the failure of Barack Obama, I guess. Say more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm jesting. I'm, I'm jesting. You know, uh, the failure of Barack, Barack Obama was the fact that there was this uh, this backlash uh, and to his uh, his presidency uh, by the white supremacists, and therefore uh, I don't believe that he understood the significance of his presidency mm-hmm. uh, in, in association to uh, the ideals of um, uh, what he represented to the black community. Uh, he, in my opinion, he did not show up. That's for certain uh, for black folks. Uh, uh, and by virtue of his own presence uh, in the White House, uh, caused this kind of angst amongst white supremacists that they have the need for to have this backlash and elect someone uh, totally opposite of what Barack Obama was attempting to represent. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, what helped me understand it was again going to history and looking at the white racist terror that followed reconstruction, you know, that really for me helped me to understand the the backlash, you know, and how someone like 45 or whatever you want to call him, Trump, let's just call him what he is, Trump got put in office, you know, and and could very well get put there again. That would be um if that if that should happen, uh black people, uh people of color, native americans, uh, uh latinx uh, need to uh, be prepared, right, uh, for what will be the uh, the what's what I'm looking for the results, right, uh, the repercussions of uh, having him had lost uh, his office in the, for the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there will be repercussions. Uh, white supremacy repercussions. Uh, they will make every effort to stranglehold. Uh, the governing of this country uh, by the ideals of white supremacy. And so we have to be very uh, prepared, right, if that were to happen. Uh, And as you mentioned, the possibility of that happening, uh, the likelihood of that happening uh, is scary. It is. To say the least. But listen, let me me make a point explicitly clear as well. This is not the first time that we find white people uh, uh, against other white people in uh, the issues of black people, right? And that example, of course, is the Civil War, right? North against South, right? What to do about black people, right? And uh, we're finding ourselves perhaps going back to that or reliving that type of uh, anxiety, national anxiety, right? And uh, we have to galvanize the relationships that we have, uh, 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 white people, willing and prepared to fight other white people about the lives of black people. A sober thought, a sober thought, a very sober thought, but one that we have to reflect upon. Yeah, I mean, I think every white, you know, as a white person, you know, every white person needs to really, who wants to say they're anti-racist or says they care about black people and cares about, you know, whatever you want to call it, equality, You know, some people will say, will go as far as to say liberation, you know, but let's say people want to say equality. They believe in human rights, right? It's like every white person needs to ask ourselves, like, what what does that really mean, you know, when it comes right down to it? Okay, let me give another example there. I was once reading uh, Malcolm X's book, his autobiography, right? And he shared with us uh, a... um, an uh, experience that he had with a young white woman. I think he made a presentation, I think maybe Philadelphia University or something of that nature. And he was coming out and a young white woman came up to him and said, what can she do? Or how can she help? And Malcolm turned to her and told her said, nothing, right? He regretted that later as he grew right, in his own humanity and understanding that she had a responsibility as well. But he should have told her she needs to go back to her community and tell them to stop being racist, right? Um, so, for me, white supremacy is a white people's problem, mm-hmm. right? It is my problem when you try to impose it upon me, right? Then it becomes my problem, right? Uh, but for long as white people want to be white or white racist or most white racist, y'all go ahead and do what y'all want to do, right? 
But when you try to impose that on me, on my children, on my children's children, then we got a problem. And so for us to end this problem, that means that white people have to go to Aunt Jenny and Uncle Bubba, right, who's carrying the, 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 the Confederate flag, and tell them that they're wrong. I tell them that they need to put that stuff down. Or they need to change their mind, right, in terms of their thinking of the uh, of the world from which we live in, right? And so the onus of white supremacy is on white people to challenge white people against this this aberration in our uh, in our in our in our, uh, in our world. It's the aberration of uh, our human society. Absolutely. You know, I want to I want to go back again, not like you want to go there, but I want to go back for a minute to the pr- to your time in prison. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want to go back there again. <laughs> I know. I don't want you going back there either. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, 50 years, 50 years is longer than I've been alive. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know, I know you're, I know you kept busy organizing i you know you talked about even what you did in solitary you know reading working on another working on this proposal i also know you like on a personal level just from all the our communication i know you're like a deeply caring human being you know i know that about you how did you survive 50 years in prison organizing right that's how i survived no that that listen they have my body in prison and never had my mind and spirit in prison my mind and spirit has always been with the people. My mind and spirit has always been out there doing the work. All right, when I first came into prison, I, I was arrested in 1971, right? And then actually, I actually go through the trials I had to go through, uh, both in California and, and in New York. Um, uh, by the time I was actually settled into a prison, uh, I decided I was going to be an organizer once I, while I was in prison. All right, so I was organized before I came to prison. I was organized while in prison. I was organized as I come out of prison. That's what I do. I'm an organizer. So I created the first uh, national uh, uh, prisoner's newspaper, a right, registered newspaper, uh, back in 1977 called Army Spirit. Right, I was the first one to organize a national march uh, to the United Nations. Had the first petition uh, organized to the United Nations that were actually heard in the subcommittee of the United Nations dealing with the issues of prisoners' rights and political prisoners in the United States. Uh, I organized a, a, a march uh, into Washington, D.C. on the issues of political prisoners. Uh, that was in uh, 1980, 1998. And that uh, evolved into uh, uh, the Jericho Movement, uh, the National Jericho Movement. People can go to uh, the Jericho Movement.com and learn about political prisoners. That organization has now, I'm the, the only living co-founder of, uh, of the National uh, uh, Jericho Movement. Uh, now in existence, uh, 21 years, 26, 21 years, the, the premier organization uh, that has been advocating in support of political prisoners in the United States. Uh, in um, 2018, as I already mentioned, I put out a proposal for the international jurors to return to the United States. And uh, that uh, will be happening on, on October 22nd to the 25th uh, in uh, New York and Harlem. Uh, we will have that campaign. Uh, amongst many other uh, things that I organized or had organized while in prison, organizing strikes, organizing demonstrations, been put in solitary confinement, organizing strikes and hunger strikes, and at times uh, while in, in confined in solitary confinement. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, my uh, years of imprisonment has honed me, has sharpened uh, my weapon in regards to uh, my capacity to engage in struggle, right, to learn these lessons. You know, I've had 50 years of study. You know, I think if anyone has 50 years of study as I've had, uh, they probably have two or three PhDs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, so, and testing theory into practice. And so, uh, one of my books, uh, uh, one of the books that I've written, uh, we, are on our own, we Are Our Own Liberators, is, uh, was written over t- 20 years ago. And it's resonating with young people today, or the things that I said, with the things I've written uh, 20, 21 years ago. Uh, and so that book uh, is a manual in my thinking, right, uh, that I'm sharing with people uh, across the country. Uh, in fact, so once I got out, I did a, um, a six-week uh, uh, series, uh, a Zoom, right, uh, teaching from the book from cover to cover. And I had 60 young people on, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays 
uh, for six weeks, uh, going through this entire book uh, with me. And uh, you know, unfortunately, it's out of print now. And I'm trying to work on a means to get it back into print uh, because, again, there's, there's a need for uh, what is conveyed uh, in that particular book. Uh, some universal principles that you know, are, are timeless in regards to what it means to be involved in struggle, uh, to identify oneself as a revolutionary, right, as I do, right? And let me just take a moment to define that for you, all right? Having the years to really look at uh, what it means to be a revolutionary and understanding and, and studying uh, revolutions uh, in Cuba, in Latin America, in Africa, and in Asia, uh, I've come to the conclusion that the revolutionary, if you take the R off, what word did you have? Evolutionary. Evolutionary, right, exactly right. And as a sociologist, right, we understand that that you know, society evolves uh, evolutionary. It's, it's an evolutionary process of society's involvement, as it is of man's own involvement, right? And so the, the, the method by which uh, we are engaging in the evolutionary process is through the process of revolution. And so a revolutionary is actually an evolutionary, right? He's the person or persons who sees the, the evolving of human society from one state of existence to a greater and quality state of existence. And they move that along, they move that process along. Sometimes the process is violent, sometimes it is nonviolent. Uh, we can look at uh, Martin Luther King as an example. Martin Luther King was a, an evolutionary, right? Uh, he brought the social order of the United States out of the Jim Crow era into one that we would think was more equitable, right, in, in, in its own diversity as the United States. That's an evolutionary process, right? If we look at what happens to black people from the days of slavery to where we are today, it's an evolutionary process. And the ever flows of, of that process, there were times when it was revolutionary, right? That those individuals who engaged in that process was, in fact, revolutionaries. Okay, and so we find that in terms of identifying oneself as a revolutionary, you're actually identifying yourself as a social evolutionary, that we are changing the social dynamics of our existence from one quality or state of existence to a greater and better quality and state of existence. And oftentimes it is bloody. Oftentimes it is violent. And the reason why, because the old do not die, right? They have to be thrown out, right? They have to get rid of in order for the new to be to evolve and and to grow and to and to, and, to, and to flourish, all right. And so the process is basically getting rid of the old and bringing in the new, okay. And these new ideas, new way of thinking, new way of behavior. Because thought precedes action. How you think is the determining factor of how you're going to act or how you're going to behave. And if we're thinking in old terms and old ways, you continue to act in old ways and old terms uh, in, in, in your own behavior. And so for us, uh, become a revolutionary. Uh, is should be an honor, right? Every sociologist, right, if they're actually thinking to real make real changes in the social structure of society at large, then they have to become revolutionaries, right? Uh, they have to get rid of the old and bring in the new. And for all, more often than not, that's not an easy task. It's a very difficult task because the old, the old do not die, right? They have to be removed, right? Yeah, if anything, they, as they feel any momentum and change coming, they clamp down on their power. That's right. That's right. That's right. We see and that. Give, and let, me, let me just give you one other um, issue uh, that people are not really giving any serious thought to in regards to the system of capitalism. Right? Uh, the other day, I had some young people over to the house, and uh, I have, a, I have a, a Alexa, right? <laughs> People say, you know, that, you know, that's, you know, they're data mining you. I say, okay, cool. Uh, but I asked Alexa, I said, how many billionaires are in the United States? And Alexa answered, there's 540 billionaires in the United States. 540 billionaires in the United States. So I asked Alexa, well, what is the accumulated wealth of the 540 billionaires? And Alexa answered, $2.6.9 trillion, right? Including to all the wealth of Western Europe. 540 people, all the wealth of Western Europe, right? That's about 28,000 families, right? Controls, for the most part, what happens or do not happen in the United States, right? So here we have a population of 340, 330 million people, and we're allowing 540 people to control our lives, right? To have us fighting for the crumbs off their table. 
What are we doing? And that's when I made the argument about our own complicity, right? We are having our own complicity to our own oppression, right? We are permitting, we are permitting, consciously permitting 540 people, 540 billionaires to control the wealth of this country. That's insane, insane. And we are fighting for the crumbs. So we don't understand how destructive capitalism actually is when people are hoarding wealth, hoarding wealth, and people are starving in the streets. People are homeless. Right? People don't have proper medical care. Right? People have been sent to prison in mass out of poverty. 540 people, right? Controlling all the wealth of this country. Come on, man. Come on. That's the same. Absolutely. We're complicit. Totally. We're complicit. We're complicit. But those are facts. Right? It's how we view and understand the world in which we live in. All right. And as sociologists, right, we should be very clear and very truthful about the reality in which we live in, about the reality of capitalism and how it operates. Capitalists and imperialists and how it operates, that this system is based upon. All right. As sociologists. And if we don't do that, then you're not only lying to the people who which you are covering, right? You're lying to yourself. 100%. Powerful words, man. Hey, I'm going to tell the truth. Truth to power, bro. Speak truth to power. I wouldn't have it any other way, man, having you on here. Fact. So as we're going to wrap things up, you know, you had mentioned that class you did about your book, Mm -hmm. We Are Our Own Liberators. Do you Mm -hmm. have any plans for more classes like that? And I know I've heard some things about a podcast and a YouTube channel so let people know you know what you're going to be up to and how people can get in touch sure sure uh, absolutely um i'm looking forward uh to um uh, starting a podcast all right I, I don't know how soon it will be it probably won't be until next year i'm still learning the, the technology that is involved with this yeah technology is kicking my butt you know what I mean? <laughs> after, just, after 50 years in prison and coming out and finding this new world of technology i mean the iphone was a well listen that was a challenge for me you know what I mean? understanding how this thing this damn thing works <laughs> i got some handle on it right now and you got some pretty much handle on, on the computers yeah i think you're pretty um, on point man well, I'm, I'm learning. You know, you have to help me out to get on this program, you know. <laughs> so, but it's all good. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, uh, within the, the next uh, few months, I will be starting my own podcast. And it's going to be called We Are On Liberators, a conversation with Jalil Luther King. Nice. So, people got to keep keep the lookout for that. And how can people stay up on what you're doing, though, when they, you know, to see what, what you're up to? Well, I do not have a uh, Facebook. I don't do social media. Uh, like that, uh, I hopefully soon will put up my own blog uh, soon and be starting to blog out, you know, like, like I was doing in prison prior to my going to the pro board. Um, you know, I had to take it down before we go to the pro board because, uh, you know, we had to uh, sanitize, you know, an image in order for us to, uh, to get released from prison. You know, it's what they are expecting of us. It's the kind of hoops that we have to jump through in order to uh, gain our freedom, you know, uh, not inconsistent to uh, what black people have to do in this country in order to survive, you know, kind of white supremacy hoops that we have to go through. Uh, every day. Through, uh, every day. Right? Work, at work, yeah, as, school. As a fact, as, as a fact you know. Uh, I have made mention uh, the other day in the podcast uh, with my cousin uh, on, on Hello Black, uh, the, how traumatized the black people are in this country. You know, we've been traumatized for over 450 years by dealing with the issues of white supremacy. From the time that we walk into a grocery store or a shopping mall and we're being watched, being followed just because we're black, to the time where we drive down the streets and the police car uh, drives past or behind you, right, and you're traumatized, not knowing whether the person's going to pull you over and murder you, right, uh, just for the existence because you're black. Uh, the, the whole dynamic involved with that idea of being black in America, uh, for the most part, is traumatizing. And, and so we have to. Uh, really uh, delve deep uh, within our own trauma uh, to find liberation, to find emancipation, to become abolitionists, right? I was talking to young people the other day, talking about uh, what does abolition mean, right? And I said, listen, you're in the city of the greatest abolitionists that ever lived, uh, Frederick Douglass. This is his home. This is his city, right? And we need to resurrect that legacy of Frederick Douglass. 
But in so doing, uh, we have to take it to another level. To another level, in, in as much as slavery has not been abolished in the United States, but rather has been institutionalized into the penal system, right? We have to abolish everything that's anti-black. If it's anti-black, it needs to be abolished, all right? And so we need to grow into the idea of being emancipators and abolitionists and liberators, right? And that's the reason why I wrote the book. We are our own liberators. Yeah, I, I heard you say that on Hello Black, and I actually tweeted it out because I loved that. And so many people are talking about abolitionist thinking and action these days. But I want, but the way you said it was so powerful, and I'm so glad you said it again on here. And then as far as folks keeping up with you, you know, once you get all this stuff going, of course, I'll post it where I can post it, you know, send it out. So anyone who's following, doing the work can check it out. But I also recommend that people check out Hella Black because I know they'll also be, first of all, their podcast is amazing and the work they're doing um, with the people's programs is phenomenal. It's, it's the continuation of the legacy of the, of the Panthers. Uh, that's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah, I I am very proud of my cousin uh, Abbas uh, Mutakim. He took my last name. You know, I ain't mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> Abbas Mutakim and his his working partner uh, uh, Delancey Parham, uh, very good brothers. Like I said, they spent a couple of weeks with me here at my house, and uh, we just chopped it up for for two weeks and really got into uh, what it is to be an abolitionist, what it is to be an emancipator, what it is to be a liberator. And uh, they're taking the, the the science, the science, uh, and uh, put it into application in the Bay Area. Uh, they just recently uh, um, uh, got a bus uh, so they can uh, do uh, health clinics, a, a mobile health clinic in the community. Uh, they are doing, doing food packages in, in the community. And, and most recently, an organization here in, in Rochester, they call themselves the young people, call themselves the People's Liberation Program are now uh, giving away food packages and trying to build these, what we call decolonization programs. You know, the Black Panther Party had a program called uh, a Survival Pending Revolution, mm -hmm. right? And in my thinking, in terms of Survival Pending Revolution, it's defensive. It's Survival Pending Revolution, right? And I think we need to flip that. We need to turn that on its head and develop programs that are a pro uh, 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 revolution, right? And so we are calling these programs now decolonization programs. Right. At least suppose where we are trying to empower the community to decolonize the, the community uh, and to empower the community. And in so doing, creating the condition for which a movement for change, real change, evolutionary change, revolutionary change can happen. All right. And so um, uh, many organizations, there are some organizations in the communities across the country are building uh, decolonization programs and using those terms, use that those names, that narrative. Right. Names is important. Now, words are important. And how you identify what you're doing is extremely important. And so instead of survival pending revolution, uh, we've been decolonization as part of the revolutionary process. Yeah, I like that, man. I, I heard you talking about that, too. So I hope folks will check out Hella Black, I, you know, and, and get involved in wherever they're at, you know, get involved wherever your community's at, tap into these decolonization programs or create your own and if you need guidance on it there's folks who will help with that who are who are doing that work there's one more thing i wanted to ask you before we go and it goes back to something you said early on and then we got into so many other things so i know i said we were wrapping up but you know you talked about that class that you did in prison the one that they put you in solitary for yeah and you said that you were um you know you were doing education with folks who were lot other other folks locked up right yeah what were those conversations like like i just that was one of the things i just thought i really wanted to know like <laughs> what those conversations were like with you because i because i remember many years ago you and i talking about some of like generational differences also sure. with like guys inside and but yeah what was what were those conversations like you know were they taken to what you were talking about well um if you're a teacher Right. Uh, one thing that you appreciate about teaching, when you see that light bulb turn on in a student, you can say that person, they get it. Right. That's rewarding for the teacher. And so and when I'm in a classroom and I'm teaching, that's what I'm looking for. I look for that light bulb to turn on. Right. And the process by which we do so is to determine how the teacher really uh, know the subject. Right. 
and, and know the, uh, their, their student uh, and how to interact and interchange with the student. Uh, for me, I was fortunate because I, in prison, uh, as part of my quote unquote rehabilitation, <laughs> part of my rehabilitation was that I was engaging and in organizing inside the prisons. And so by virtue of that alone, I got some degree of respect amongst other prisoners. And so when it came to my room, came into my classroom, they brought that with them. They understand that this is an OG. This OG, uh, he earned his stripes, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, what he has to say, uh, we should listen to. And so those who did not, nah, let me make this point explicitly clear. The individuals who came to the class were the individuals who had some degree of understanding there was a need for change, right? And so where I may have a population in a uh, prison of 1,300 men in prison, right, or 900 men in prison, or 500 men population in prison, I only get 30 guys, 20 guys to come to the class, okay? And so these are the individuals who are prepared, uh, who have some understanding of their, their trauma, right, some understanding of the system uh, that they are navigating, right? And as a result, they come to the class to learn how to, to better navigate from someone who has some degree, some degree of understanding uh, of that process. So uh, for me, it was it's the interaction uh, with the young brothers coming inside prison and who had, hey, who is this OG that we got respect for, right? And uh, what's, what's he kicking in this classroom? And when they come to the class and they see how I'm teaching and the information that I'm imparting upon them, uh, and materials are asking them to read, uh, they become awoke. They become woke. That's the word they use today. They become woke. And once they become woke, you can't unwoke them. <laughs> you can't put them back to sleep. Okay. And uh, they then become activists or become active, uh, organizers inside the prison system. And so that's the reason why they had to, one of the reasons why they wanted to lock me down, because I was trying to take the these uh, street organizations, street gangs, uh, uh, mentality and changing from criminal mentality into a revolutionary mentality. You know, uh, that has to be the objective. Unfortunately, uh, that kind of organizing has not gone in our communities uh, as, it, as it should. And uh, so we're trying to make some efforts to make some inroads today uh, to find these uh, street organizations and um, offer them, right, uh, another way, right? Uh, offer them some another way to think about their own survival. And we definitely need to, again, I talk about the trauma of our communities, right? I'm also talking about the, the, the uh, lynching ice and black on black crime, right? That's traumatic. And where does that come from? I'm talking about the, the conditions that which black mothers are found on, uh, on have to, get, to resort to, to welfare because they can't get a job. And due to the, the, the aberrant conditions of our, our school system. I'll give another example and I'm going to make this real short. Here in Rochester, Rochester School District is is the, the fifth worst school district in the country. The fifth worst school district in the country, right? Uh, 80 to 90 percent, 80 percent of the uh, uh, population, school population are black and brown, right? They're being taught by 80 percent white teachers, mm. okay? A majority of them are women, and the majority of them live outside of the city, right? Outside of the city, right? They live out in the suburbs. And they come into the suburbs to try to teach black and brown children, right? That's a blatant disconnect, right? It's a culturally uh, uh, disconnect. Uh, um, uh, Carter G. Wilson wrote a book called The Miseducation of the Negro, right? And we find that that continuance of that kind of miseducation when you don't have the cultural foundation for these young people, black and brown uh, students are able to really look at a teacher and see themselves, Right? Uh, this inherent and innate racism that's brought into these classrooms and teaching these black and brown babies, right? No wonder there's this degree of failure, right? Uh, it is because the system is created, uh, is, is structured uh, for these young people to fail, right? And so we need to change that. And that's the reason why we had so many people, young people, dropping out of school and end up in mass incarceration. Hey, right? this is designed. Mm -hmm. This is designed, you know? If you have people who have, have think tanks, policy, policy, public policy think tanks, and they don't see this as a problem, right. wait a minute, there's something wrong with them think tanks, all right? Or they're functioning as they were designed to function. Yeah, like when people are like, oh, the system's broken. It's like, no, it's not. No, no it's not. The system was functioning the way it was designed to function, all right? And it is our problem that we have not yet faced that, you know? 
uh, being truthful with ourselves and being truthful with one another in terms of how the system functions and operates to the detriment, to the detriment of black, brown, and indigenous people in this country. Julio, we've talked about so much, man. You've, you've shared so much knowledge like you always do. And I'm so grateful that you took the time to come on here. You know, this has been great just having this much time talking with you, even though we've been in touch. Um, you know, it's been, I think one of the best things was like FaceTiming, you know, when you <laughs> got up being able to like actually see you, you know, talk with you like that after so, it. after so long. Um, but you know, man, just thank you so much for coming on here. And, and of course, you know, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you for doing the work. Yeah, well, I appreciate you. And, and uh, for anybody in New York State, in, in New York City, New York State, uh, I petitioned you to uh, check out Jericho Movement, check out uh, spiritofmandela.org, and I also ask you to become a member of Citizen Action, right? Although it is a nonprofit organization, right? It is doing some good work. And uh, I think people need to learn about uh, Citizen Action. Go to their website. Uh, Citizen Action of New York, and just look at the stuff that they're doing. Uh, and if you find what they're doing is uh, resonates with you, uh, become a member, join, uh, uh, help us do the work. Thanks again, man. It's my pleasure, my brother. Thank you for listening to Doing the Work, Frontline Stories of Social Change. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please follow on Twitter and leave positive reviews on iTunes. If you're interested in being a guest or know someone who's doing great work, Please get in touch and thank you for doing real work to make this world a better place. Peace.